Hypothesis testing is a broad term that means we're using inferential statistical analysis to decide whether or not the null hypothesis should be rejected. I'm going to approach this conceptually first before breaking down the steps. This is kind of a modification to the logic chart in your textbook. When we do hypothesis testing, we start with the null hypothesis, which in practical terms is that the status quo is just fine. So if we're studying an intervention, the null hypothesis says that the intervention's not worth anything. If we are studying the relationship between two variables, the null hypothesis says there's no connection or relationship. If we try to predict from a regression equation, the null hypothesis says that there's nothing we can predict from those variables. So think of it as the status quo, like a straw man that you want to punch down or reject by doing your research. And your research relates to the alternative hypothesis. And this is what you are really, what you're really wanting to provide evidence for is that there is an effect or that the, the, um, there is a relationship or you can predict. But you don't ever, in, in uh, statistical analysis, you're not ever able to say that the alternative hypothesis is true. Instead, you always use the evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Basically, we have to make a decision. Are we going to keep the status quo or reject it and propose something else? So we take a sample and we analyze it. If the sample analysis shows that the intervention, effect, relationship, or prediction is statistically significant, we reject that null hypothesis. If the sample shows, however, that the effect or the relationship, the prediction or whatever is not statistically significant, significant, we keep the null hypothesis. There are a lot of different research questions we can approach this way. We may want to see if a new drug for hyperactivity is better than the old one. Or we may want to see if a socialization intervention helps aggressive students or we want to, may want to see if one group of students have better scores than another statistically. All of these can be addressed by term, determining whether or not the information from the sample is, can statistically let us reject the null hypothesis or not. Let me tell you a make-believe story. A state provides funding for scholarships to a state university, college, or other post-secondary training for all high school graduates with a 3.25 GPA. So there's a certain number of these graduating seniors who are going to get this um, scholarship provided by the state. Each year, the governor has to come up with the funding to pay for these scholarships. When the program started, the average GPA for a graduating senior was 2.75 and they could project what they needed in scholarship funding. Lately, though, some in the state have started to wonder if GPAs are rising. Perhaps there is great inflation with the pressure to help students. Perhaps students are actually working harder because of the scholarship incentive. So the governor needs to see if the current GPA is indeed higher than the 2.75 they've been using for projections. So a sample of 400 students is pulled from across the state and their GPAs are averaged. Lo and behold, the average GPA for the sample is 2.85 with a standard deviation of 0.65. Should the governor be getting worried? Well, we don't know for sure yet. That sample of 400 students was one of an infinite number of samples that could have been drawn from all of the state students. If there are 30,000 seniors graduating each year, think of how many combinations of 400 students you could have pulled. If the average of the population is really 2.75, we know that about 90, 95%, 95% of the samples we pull are going to be within two standard deviations above or below that mean. Sorry for the horrible articulation here. I've got a really bad cold. So what we really need to know is if that sample GPA of 
falls within the range of 95% of the possible samples? Or is it way out in the tail where it's really unlikely that it represents the population? So it's pretty straightforward. We need to know where in this sampling distribution of the mean that new that sample GPA of 2.85 is. So now let's do a hypothesis test. Our null hypothesis or the status quo is that the average GPA for graduating seniors in the state is 2.75. This statement or way of writing the null hypothesis is actually read the hypothesis the null hypothesis is such that the mean for the population is 2.75. Our alternative hypothesis is that the average GPA for graduating seniors is any other num number, any number from 0 to 4, but not 2.75. So this reads the alternative hypothesis is such that the mean does not equal 2.75. The next step is to set our decision point for whether or not we're going to reject that null hypothesis. Remember that this is all based on probabilities of pulling a particular sample GPA. Are we willing to make a mistake and reject the null hypothesis when we should not? What if the GPA is still 2.75 but we say it's higher? Are we willing to take a chance of making that mistake 5% of the time, 1% of the time, 10% of the time. In my make-believe story, I'm going to say that the governor is willing to live with a chance of making that mistake 5% of the time. So my alpha is 0.05 or 5%. This is called the level of significance. Basically, I'm setting a cutoff line, a line in the sand. I'm saying that if the sample mean is above or below the rejection point, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis because the the chance of pulling the probability of pulling that sample it from this sampling distribution is so rare that I can reject the null hypothesis. Notice how changing the significance level changes the percent of samples that are acceptable in my sampling distribution of the mean. If I set a significance level of 5%, these regions of the distribution will lead to rejecting the null hypothesis. So if my sample is out in either of those tails, I'm going to reject that null hypothesis of 2.75. It would tell us that the sample mean we pulled is very unlikely if that, that null hypothesis is correct. But what if I change the significance level to 1%? There's a much, much smaller probability that my 2.85 sample GPA is way out in that rejection area and it becomes much more difficult to reject the null hypothesis. On the other end, perhaps I go the other way and set my significance level at 10%. You can see that my sample GPA now has a much larger chance of being in the areas of the distribution that suggest I reject the null hypothesis. So I will stay with 5%, pretty typical for this kind of analysis. For step three, I need a number. In other words, I need to know how many standard deviations from the population mean my sample's mean is so that I know where I can place it along that sampling distribution. A z-score gives me the number of standard deviations. So I compute the z-score for my sample mean of 2.75. And when I do that, I end up with a z-score of 3.08. <coughs> so I now know that my sample population, or not sample population, the sample I drew the mean of it is more than three standard deviations from the mean in the sampling distribution, way out in the tails. <coughs> so last of all, I need to make a decision about that null hypothesis. If my sample mean 
of 2.85 is more than 3.08 standard deviations above the mean. It is way out in the tails of my sampling distribution for the mean. There's actually a shortcut to looking at the cutoff point. We know that very close to 95% of the samples we could pull from any given um, group of means are going to be just a little below two standard deviations above or below the mean. So anytime you get a statistic or z-score of more than two or precisely 1.96, you can reject the null hypothesis with a 5% significance level. The table you can use is actually quite small. If the value of your test statistic is higher than these, you reject the null. So according to this table, I re would reject the null hypothesis because my test statistic is 3.08 standard deviations above the mean. So if my test statistic is that high at a 5% significance level, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. I can be pretty confident saying that the sample I pulled with a mean of 2.85 is different, statistically different, than the mean we were assuming was in place. This is what we call statistically significant p less than 0.05. In other words, there is much less in this case than a 5% chance that I would pull that sample mean of 2.85 from a population that really had a mean of 2.75. I would be really confident telling the governor that we needed to update our financial projection because yes, the graduating seniors' GPAs are higher than we were planning. Going back to my original make-believe story, what if I changed my alternative hypothesis slightly and said that in my alternative, my alternative is such that the population that the mean is greater than 2.75. This sets up a directional hypothesis. When we set an alpha of 5%, our, our um, level of significance, we actually split the 5% into the two tails of the sampling distribution of the mean, with 2.5% being the area of rejection in either tail, adding up to 5%. But if I have a directional hypothesis, I'm saying that I can disregard half of the sampling distribution. I'm only interested in whether I can reject the null with a mean that is greater than the null's mean. Now, all of my 5% significance level is in one tail, not two. Nothing changes in what I do, but the area of my sampling distribution that is for the rejection is much larger. A hypothesis that is two-tailed is non-directional. We're splitting that significance level between the two tails. You use this column. If you're testing with um, that the mean equals a hypothesis that is one-tailed means that you're using this column because you're using a greater than or less than sign. And that's really all there is to it. We make a null hypothesis, which is the status quo. There's no effect. There's no difference. It's a straw man that we're actually researching to try and reject. Then we develop an alternative hypothesis, which is really what we think is happening, but we're never going to prove that. All we're going to do is reject a null hypothesis. Finally, we use statistics from the sample to decide whether or not we should reject the null hypothesis based on the probability underlying the sampling distribution of pulling that mean, of pulling that sample.